chapter 1, we're down around verse number, let's see where we're at. I think we're almost to 23, morning. Verse number 23, but it says, but they heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which he once destroyed. Galatians chapter 1 verse 23, and they glorified God in me. Now this is not popular preaching. It's not going to be popular for Sunday school even, but notice he says now. Do you see the word now? (laughs) In times past, he persecuted. Do you see the word now? It manifests repentance. Do you see that? A lot of people don't like this word repentance. Like it's some kind of cuss word or something. There, Like it's invented by people who are evil. It's a Bible word. It's a Bible word. Listen, the first words you see out of John the Baptist's mouth, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus preached repentance. Peter preached repentance. Paul preached repentance. It's all through the scriptures. One of the marks of a Christian who is real and fruit in his life is repentance. Now, repentance is not a one-time act. Did you know that? People people, um, um, look at repentance like, yeah, I repented of my sins. And people say, well, repentance of sins is not in the Scriptures. Hebrews chapter number 6 says repentance from dead works. You cross-reference that with Ephesians 2. And he says you were quickened who are dead in trespasses and sin. Yes, repentance of sin is mentioned in the Scriptures. It's not phrased. People have you say, well, the Bible doesn't say repent of your sins. How could you possibly remember all your sins? First of all, you don't even understand the the Scriptures to begin with when you talk like that. You've got a serious problem anyway. Does repentance, let me ask you this, does repentance of sin save you? No, it doesn't. I've seen a lot of people turn from drinking, coming home from a bar. Right? I'm never doing that again. Oh, I feel so awful. And then the next, guess what? They don't really repent of it. They go and do it again. Right? So repentance doesn't save you. Faith in what Christ has done for you alone saves you. But, let me say this. There is a a repentant spirit in every person who's saved. Listen, you've got to change your mind about the way you're living if you're ever going to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you love the way you're living, how are you going to turn to God? Listen, when I was in my sin, I don't know how you felt about it, but when I first started sinning, I liked it. It was great. I enjoyed it. I did what I wanted to do. I thought it was fun. The first time I ever got drunk, I thought it was fun. First time I ever got high, I thought it was fun. First time I ever uh, did things that I shouldn't have done, I thought they were fun. The Bible speaks of the pleasures of sin for a season. You think fornication is rampant in this land and adultery is rampant in this land, it's not fun? It is fun. It's enjoyable. Your flesh likes it. But there's a wage associated with it. And so when you start realizing... It might be fun now, but it's going to cost me an eternity. Then you start going, I don't think I want to live like this no more. And you turn to God, ask Him to help you. He gives you a clean slate through Jesus Christ. But He does expect you to have a change of heart. And listen, can you point to anybody in the Scriptures? Just give me one true believer in the Scriptures that didn't change. Just one. Give me one. You do not find that record anywhere in the Scriptures. We're going to go through that. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians 7. Listen. True Bible salvation always, always, always manifests itself in Bible repentance. You begin to be sorry for what you've done. You begin to want to do better. Listen. What Christian is there among us who wants to stay in their sin. That's not a real Christian, y'all. That's not a real Christian. Uh, Does that mean you're going to be sinless? No, but it means you should sin less. Right? You should. There's a heart of repentance. Repentance is not a cuss word, it's a Bible word. 
I want you to see this. Listen, you got preachers from the pulpit that are downplaying repentance. Did you know that? How can you read your Bible? The word is mentioned. The word uh, repentance along with turn is mentioned multiple times. Turn, all kind of stuff like that. Listen. Bible repentance. Bible repentance is expected, we're going to see, from God. It's expected. Go to... uh, 2 Corinthians 7, look at verse number 10. What is repentance? For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Notice godly sorrow. Sorrow for what? What are you sorry for? You know what you're sorry for? Offending a holy God. That's what you're sorry for. Godly sorrow. Work with repentance unto what? Repentance unto what? Are you reading what I'm reading? There's a sorrow you must have of your sin that will work toward salvation. Listen, you, you have to see yourself the way you are Jesus didn't come and die for good people. And if you think you're okay, you ever heard people say, I'm okay, you try to give them a God, I'm okay. Yeah. Well, you're really not, but if you think that, as long as you think that, you're not getting any help. You've got to be broke before you see the need to be fixed. You have to be sick before you need, see the need to go to a doctor. And you have to see yourself a sinner before you need healing of Jesus Christ. He didn't come die for good people. The gospel is how that Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 15. For godly sorrow work with repentance unto salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of this world work of death. This world is sorry because they got caught. They're not sorry because they've offended a holy righteous God and need forgiveness. You understand the sorrow of this world work of death. It doesn't fix anything. But a godly sorrow, look at this. Verse number 11, look at the definition. To me, this is a a really good definition of repentance. For the selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in. You know what repentance is? It is a carefulness. You're cautious now. You're you're on guard. You know that that the influences of the world, the flesh and the devil had ruined you, and now you're, you're trying to resist it. Look, look, look what it says here. For the self-same thing that you saw it after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. What clearing of yourself. You know what you want when you come to Jesus Christ? You want to be cleared. I am dirty, I am rotten, and, and somebody is offering me a way to be cleaned up and have a clean slate. Two times in the book of Hebrews, he says, your sin, chapter 8, chapter 10. He says, your sins and iniquity, I remember no more. Isn't that a blessed promise that God is willing to remit our sins? The word remission is mentioned. He's willing to remove it, take it away. He's blotted it out. That's a blessing. Why would you not want that? See, you're, tra- you're trading true relief for a Band-Aid. That's all it is. You've got a Band-Aid on it. Take the Band-Aid off and let the Lord heal it. Your Band-Aid ain't going to last for so long. That little thing you're putting on there worldly wise, that little alcohol you're drinking to soothe the pain, that little, that little drugs you're taking to ease the pain, it ain't going to fix it. It's temporary. It's temporary. The true fix, and it's amazing, we try to find fixes in ways that are not godly, and they don't work. Temporarily, they may seem to work, because they ease the pain or take your mind off of it, but when you sober up, guess what? You're right back where you started. You know what the Lord wants to do? He says, come unto me. Listen to me. Matthew 11, he says, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. He said, and I will give you rest. Why would you choose to relieve that burden in a way that never gives rest? It makes the burden heavier. He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Don't you want to have rest for your soul? There's rest. If I can describe uh, what the Lord has brought to my life, it's rest, it's peace. Listen, it's assurance, clearing. 
Yes, ma'am. Here's the problem. If you don't die to yourself, that guilty conscience begins loading back up. But what I appreciate about the God of heaven, he knew that after he saved us, we still were going to sin. So he still provided a way. He said if we confess our... That's, that's not a formula to get saved. That's a formula to have a relationship with the Savior after he saved you. Right? We can, you don't get saved by confessing your sins. That's not in the Bible in other places. We get saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But confessing your sins is the way to have peace with God. Listen, as a saved man, I confess my sins since the day he saved me. But I don't confess them because I need to get saved again. See, I didn't understand this. I was raised in a church that taught us we can lose our, our salvation. So I thought I was confessing my sins so that I can get saved again. And I would sin, and then, and then I would confess them again, and I got saved again. And I would confess them again, and I got saved again. And when I finally realized that the Bible, speaking of confession of sin, was speaking to people who were already saved in 1 John chapter number 1, it was a huge relief because it wasn't a license to sin. It was a way to have relief. Listen, he saves you, cleans you, excites you, gets you stirred up. And the whole world is full of roses and lilies and sunshine and excitement. And you love all the brethren. And everybody's great. You're not bitter toward anybody. You love them. And then all of a sudden, you realize, I still got a problem. And Satan raises his ugly head, and your flesh raises its ugly head, and the world raises its ugly head and entices you, and you're back in some of the things you shouldn't have been in uh, three or four years later that you didn't think you could do the day after you got saved. Here you are doing them again. Thank God. He's merciful. He says, you know, you come on back here. I already saved you. You're my child. And I've been dealing with you. And I've been bringing conviction on your life for all this time over those sins you committed. But you come on back here. I got a source of relief. All you got to do to have a relationship with me, you're already my child. It's just own what you've done. And I'll forgive you. And then you can have a relationship again. Uh, listen, the reason so many, I believe some do get saved, and then they wander away. The solution is very simple. But it's so simple, some people think it's not possible. It is. Listen, number one, you need to examine yourself whether you're in the faith. You need to know whether you're saved to begin with. Right? The second thing, if you are saved, if you're not saved, there's a remedy for that. <laughs> Ain't that a blessing? There's a remedy for you not being saved. And if you are saved, guess what? There's a whole set of verses for you if you've broken fellowship with the one who saved you. Isn't that a blessing? Our God is not like any other God. He is so merciful and kind. Listen, He's provided a way for all of us to find relief. But the relief is a decision you make. He's already made up his mind to bring the relief if we would turn to him. Look at what it says here. Verse 11 again. For behold the selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in, ye, in you. Yea, what clearing of yourself. Yea, what indignation. Woo, what's this? Yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. You know what that manifests? Vehement desire. You know what a vehement desire is? It's earnest. It's, it's an ad a revenge. A revenge against what? What do you want revenge against now? I'm going to tell you something. The sins you struggled with the most when God saves you or gets your life straightened out, that'll be the one that you're against the most. You'll stand against it. You'll speak out against it without apology. Because you want to revenge it. You know what you're trying to do? You guys hear me talk. Uh, I, get, I get people all the time. Preachers tell me all the time. I've had 
dear friends of mine, saints of God who love me, say, look, you don't need to be telling all this stuff about your life. It's going to make people think evil. And you know what I say? I don't care what people think. I know what God did for me, and my story can help somebody else find some relief. You want to think evil of me? That's on you. It ain't on me. I know I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. How about you? You're not as dirty and rotten as me? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You think about it, what people are saying. Oh, the preacher is really bad. Duh! So are you. Look in the mirror. <laughs> Listen, we're all in the same boat. When you start thinking that uh, the preacher is really bad, I'm really not all that, you got a problem. you got a serious problem. I don't worry about what people think about me. God knows my heart. I don't worry about defending myself. God can defend me. He's more than able to straighten you out. He's got your number. You may not think so, but He's got your number. One little health issue, one little trouble, one little struggle. He's got your number. You think He don't. You go ahead. I, I'm, I'm like, listen, I'm going to tell you what. We're going to preach about this a little bit this morning. I'm very leery about brethren who think everybody else is so wicked and everybody else has not got it figured out but me. I'm leery about people like that. I'm leery. You need to see yourself the way you really are. Brethren, we all need forgiveness. Brethren, we all need somebody to show us patience. We need people. I, I teased with my wife yesterday on the way home. She got a little bit sideways with me. I ain't going to lie about that. She got a little bit sideways, teasing a little bit too hard. But I said, honey, you persnickety. And she looked at me and raised her eyebrows. This is what she said. She looked at me and raised her eyebrows said, you want to take a vote at church at which one of us is more persnickety? I was like, oh boy. Oh boy. They know me. I told her, I said, that ain't fair. They know more about me than they do you. <laughs> uh, but look what it says. It's an attitude. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what desire. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourself to be what? clear in the matter you know why you cry out against the things that you used to cry out uh, not cry out against I, listen i'll give you an illustration i was saved about three weeks um ballpark and um i was buying drugs from a dealer that was at the job i was at i worked at athena marble years ago these people are probably dead most of them are dead anyway so it don't really matter but um i was buying from there and I got saved. I truly got saved. I got born again. Lord turned my world upside down. And uh, that dealer came out and was trying to get me, entice me back. For the first time in my life, he gave me something for free. He never gave me nothing free. Trying to entice me back into that old lifestyle. And I told him, I got saved. I'm not doing that no more. He said, I'll give you three weeks. You'll be back. But you know what? As soon as he said that, I said, I ain't looking back. I'm done. I am so happy now, I'm done with that. You're crazy. Well, guess what? A couple days later, he came in offering me free stuff. Let me show you the desire, the repentance. This is what true repentance does. I looked at him and I said, if you don't leave me alone, I'm calling the cops. Because I knew he had it on him right then. I said, I'm going to call the cops. And I'm going to tell you what. His tune changed immediately. I was a narc from that point on. Half the plant uh, despised me at that point. But true Bible repentance will cause you to get an attitude and take a stand. Say, I'm done with that. Leave me alone. I'm done with that. I'm not going back. I don't want to go back. It's a miserable life I was living. Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. Listen, true Bible salvation, it causes repentance. It causes us to get an attitude against what was keeping us in bondage. Romans 6 shows you that there's a battle um, uh, over who's going to reign in your life. And whoever you yield to, that's who's in control. You can actually, most people think as a, um, 
As a Christian, they can't yield to the flesh. That's a lie. Quit lying to yourself. That's what Romans 6 is written about. Romans 6 is not written to lost people. The wages of sin, uh, look at the last verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's not written to, to lost people, although we quote it on the street corner, right? We, we, we quote it in the Romans road, don't we? It's not written to lost people. That's written to saved people. Guess what? Your sin still has a wage. Look at verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. Uh, how could he talk to a lost person and say that? Can you see that? Okay, lost person who doesn't have Jesus and doesn't have a way to overcome and the Holy Spirit's not on the inside. Let not sin reign in your mortal body. What? That don't even make sense. He has to be talking to a saved person. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your, ye your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You know what you can do now that you couldn't do before? You can yield to God. You, the old saying was two natures beat beneath my breast. The one I love, the one I hate. The one I feed will dominate. And it's right out of Romans chapter number 6. Listen, you couldn't do anything but yield to your flesh before you were saved. You did what lost people do. There were times in your life where you tried to comfort yourself through religion. But it didn't work. Because you didn't have God. And you couldn't yield to Him. You know what you have if you're saved here? That you didn't have before? You have the ability to yield to the Spirit of God. Let's look at this. Verse number 13, yield ye your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin. Uh, neither yield them. But yield yourselves as, uh, unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your instrument, uh, uh, members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Now watch. So, my sin's not imputed to me, so can I just live any way I want to live? Watch what he says. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God bethink that ye were servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart, notice from the heart, from the heart, from the heart. You know the difference between a lot of people is 18 inches. They have a head knowledge of what's right, but there, it's not in their heart. God wants your heart. People ask me, what does God want? Does God want my money? Does God want my car? Does God want my, my girlfriend? Does God want my relationship? Does God want my... You can fill in the blank. It's easy. God wants your heart. If He ever gets your heart, He gets the whole person. You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Verse 18, being made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness to iniqui uh, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even now yield your me uh, members servants of righteousness unto holiness. For when we were servants of sin... You were free from righteousness. What fruit had you in those things? You are now what? Woo! Somebody told me recently. I said, I'm ashamed of what I did before I met Jesus Christ. Well, you shouldn't be ashamed. This is a Christian. You shouldn't be ashamed. You shouldn't be. No, the Bible says we should be ashamed. Yeah. What brought that ashamed feeling? True Bible repentance will make you ashamed. For the end of those things is death, but now being made free from sin, you became servants of God, and you have uh, your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life, and we can go on. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Listen, Paul had a repentant heart, uh, 
anytime somebody truly gets born again, you ain't going to tell me they're not going to repent. They're going to repent. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 1. In fact, you can't find a single place in the Bible where somebody was born again that they didn't repent. Look at this group at, uh, uh, of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. 1 Thessalonians, the Holy Spirit. Is He a Holy Spirit? Is God's Spirit a Holy Spirit? So you're telling me the Holy Spirit, when you're saved, is going to come and live within you and nothing's going to change? Listen, I question. We live in a generation where if you talk to people, have you say, uh, are you saved? Yes, I'm saved. And you ask them about being saved. How did you get saved? Well, I, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Well, what did you do? I said a prayer. I, 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 I repeated after the preacher. And I, uh, well, how has your life changed? Changed? Well, I mean, I go to church. I, I didn't ask you that. How has your life changed since the Lord Jesus Christ intervened in your life? You say it's not necessary. Yeah, it is. The Holy Spirit cannot come inside and you're going to stay the same. It, does, it never happens. Never happens. 1 Thessalonians. Verse number 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. From, from you sounded forth the word... Of the, of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith toward God is spread abroad, so that you, have, uh, you need not to speak anything. For they themselves show what manner of entering in we had among, uh, uh, unto you. Look at this. How you turned to God. Do you see repentance? You turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You know what repentance is? True Bible repentance? It's turning from something to something. Listen, you've got to have a change of heart. Listen, God didn't save you to stay the same. That's what's missing with a lot of soul winning techniques nowadays. I, I, I've had people give me a hard time. Why do you talk about all this sin stuff when you're soul winning? Because sin is the heart of the problem. If you leave sin out of the issue, then you're, you're not given the gospel. The gospel is how that Christ died for our sins. Then the sin issue... Listen, did Jesus bring up sin issues? Woman at the well, what did he tell her? Go call thy husband. What's that got to do with anything? Go call thy husband. You know why? He knew she had a problem with adultery. You know what he said to that blind man when he healed him in John chapter 8 or 9 there? I think it's 9. You know what he said to him? Go and sin no more. You know what he said to the woman taken in adultery? Go and sin no more. You going to tell me God doesn't expect to change when Jesus told him you need to quit that? How do, you, how do you explain how do you explain Matthew 23 where he says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You know what he calls them? Blind guides. Did he deal with their issue? Yes, he, deal with, he dealt with their issue. Jesus didn't ignore people's issue. Listen, sin is the issue. We can't present a half gospel as if all i got to do is believe in Jesus. The devils believe and tremble. The book of James tells you that in James chapter number 2. I ask people this all the time. I take them to James 2 where it says the devils believe. Uh, Y'all believe there's one God. The devils believe and tremble. You know what I do? I take them over there and say, what makes your faith different than these devils right here? Notice they turn. Turn from God to idols to serve the living and true God. Listen, let me tell you some of America's idols. It's amazing. We think of idol Buddha. We think of idol Statue of Mary. We're hard on that. Statue of Peter. I've heard preachers talk about statues of Peter where the foot was kissed off and it's an idol. And it, it is. If you go over 
cathedral over there in Rome, you'll see that the whole foot of Peter's kissed off. They kissed it so many times it's fallen off. We say that's idolatry. Why is it we identify the idols in other people's lives? We don't identify the idols in ours. An idol is something we put before the Lord. Let me show you America's idol, they even call it American Idol. <laughs> it's sports. Sports is an idol. People miss church for, sport, for uh, their idol. They'll miss soul winning for their idol. They'll skip everything out for sports. They'll leave everything out of their lives just to obtain. Listen, 150 years from now, if the Lord doesn't come back, everybody sitting here will be dust in a grave. What did your sports matter at that point? You see, I'm trying to offer you something that even when the dust is in the grave, you will still profit from it. What's more important? See, I'm afraid a lot of people are giving up a small amount of time, small amount of history for eternity. How about this? Celebrity and fame. 90% of the children you run into, maybe more than that, you know what they're searching for? They want to be like the, the I don't even know who, who's the famous people now. Britney Spears is old news now. Yeah, Taylor Swift, who's going to find out she was uh, wrong and very wicked in the way she lived her life. And listen, that, that girl knows better. She was exposed to the truth when she was young. And she chose the devil instead. And she, if she stays that way, she's going to get the reward of the devil. She's going to be surprised. Listen, but so many people want their kids to be like that. Want their kids to be famous. Listen, they push for their kids to have... Let me show you, tell you something that is also another idol in our land. Education is an idol in our land. I'm not saying you have to be dumb. But I would much rather have somebody who doesn't have a great education but is on their way to heaven and going to spend eternity in heaven than for somebody who's got all the education and is smarter than God. They think that way anyway. How about money and possessions? We talk about the American dream. When I hear American dream, you know what I think now? Idol. The American dream is an idol in this land. It is. I'm glad I live in a land with liberty. But I ain't looking for the American dream. I'm looking for a, bid, a city whose builder and maker is God. You can have your American dream. You can have my house when I'm gone. When I'm raptured and I'm out of here and I'm gone because I still believe in a rapture. A lot of people don't even believe in that no more. But that's okay. I don't care. I still believe in it. I believe I'm going to be gone. And listen. Anybody who's left behind is welcome. I, I'll put it in my will now if you want me to. When I am raptured, you can have all my possessions. If that's what you want, I'll put it in my will now. I don't need it. Where I'm going, I ain't going to need none of it. Let me tell you something else that's an idol in this land. And it go, these two go along hand in hand. Guns and self-preservation. I, I, heard, I heard a Christian just recently tell me this. We're preppers. I have three years stored up food. And he went through all the bullets he's got stored up in his bunker you know I told him I believe in self defense but when all of this stuff comes to pass that you're talking about ain't nothing you're going to do stop people from going to getting your cans of bean and weenies it's not going to stop them they're going to charge right in pop you off and anybody else helping you and they're going to take your beans and weenies and your rice and everything you got stored up, and your bullets. 
But listen, why aren't you looking for the Lord Jesus Christ? Why are you so obsessed with that? Let me tell you something else that goes right along with this. National security is an idol in this land. We assume because America has been great for this length of time that she will always be great and always be a superpower. You better read about Rome. You better read about Babylon. You better read about Assyria. You better read about some places other than the United States of America. This country ain't even lasted as long as some of them. It ain't been around that long. What happened to my country, tis of thee? My country, it tis of God. Listen, don't put your stock down here. Th down here is not where we, we're supposed to be focused. Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to have to stop, probably pick up here next round. But Galatians 5. We're not done with this subject. I still need to finish this. Galatians 5. See, that's what happens. I thought I had twice or uh, half the amount of notes I needed, and now I didn't even get through half my notes. Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse number 6. For in Christ Jesus, circumcision, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Do you see a changed heart? It's a faith that produces a love. Look at chapter number uh, 6, verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but what? A new creature. Everywhere you point to in the Scriptures, God is trying to make a new creature. He's trying to change people. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. God is in the changing business. Acts chapter number... 16, we'll have to close right here. This will be the last one for this morning. Acts 16. <coughs> Actually, let's save that one for next week and go to Colossians. This is, a, this, is, this is something I need to drive home. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. We'll save that one for next week. Colossians chapter number 1. Read this with me carefully. Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always with you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love which ye have to all saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye have uh, heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world, look what it says, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, look what this next passage says, since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. When does the gospel begin changing a person? When does the gospel begin changing a person? He says right there, the change takes place the day you heard it. The day you heard it and made a decision to put faith in it, it begins changing you. You can't get away can't get away from it. It's all through the scriptures. We'll continue this thought on repentance next week. Now listen, we could preach on repentance, and I'm not going to get uh, hung up here, but I have probably 150 passages in the back of my Bible. This whole thing came up with um, Stephen Anderson, a uh, um, so-called independent, new independent fundamental Baptist who is corrupted um, himself. This thing came up. Uh, studying him I have a whole section in the back of my Bible that's devoted to a statement that he made that uh, repentance is works for salvation and not necessary in salvation repentance don't save you but without repentance you ain't getting saved salvation is the door 
Repentance is the porch you must be standing on to open the door. That's a fact. Nobody gets saved without changing their heart. Now, am I saying that you can remember all the sins? that you, He said, well, repentance of sin is not in the Scriptures. It is, actually. It is. It's not worded like that, but it's in the Scriptures. And this is the thing. Yeah, you can't remember all of them. You can't. You've sinned so much, you couldn't remember all of them. But God expects you to turn. You know what repentance is? It's not being able to remember all of them. It's knowing you need to bring all of them to Jesus and let him forgive you of them. That's what it's about. Amen. Let's take a break right there.